Yeah, yeah, it's the there's a black screen. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Welcome back. Sorry, technical difficulties. The okay. irony is <laughs> remarkable. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. Welcome back. We've got Dr. Recinti for his senior lecture on why ultrasound sucks. <laughs> yeah. There it is. Why ultrasound sucks. Um, yeah, sorry about that delay. The irony is unbelievable, but you know, Clark's nav keeps getting me all the way to the end. So many of you think that I like ultrasound. Um, and I think my graduation speech is probably going to be, my graduation roast is probably going to be about ultrasound, butterfly cues, and man buns. However, today I'm here to convince you that I actually don't like ultrasound that much. Um, I think there's a lot of flaws, and we're really going to highlight all of them today. But first, here's a picture of me using ultrasound probe as a microphone in Shanghai. <laughs> I gave like half my lecture like this. <laughs> I'd like to thank Dr. Silverberg, Dr. Hadi, and Dr. Song for being my inspiration for why ultrasound sucks. <laughs> thank you guys. Oh, look. More ultrasound people. <laughs> yeah. Again, why ultrasound sucks. Um, so, as I was saying, I believe point of care ultrasound itself is a failed paradigm. <clears throat> and I present to you four strong reasons why. It makes you slow. You missed financial opportunities, also because it made you slow. All the evidence is small, single-centered, poorly powered, poorly designed, and it's operator dependent. So we're gonna go through each one, one by one, and rip apart ultrasound. So first, from Pete's song, man, it makes you slow. So all of you have probably been here, especially the PGY2s. You go see a bunch of patients, you go and present to the pre-attending, and then they're like, oh, what was the cardiac ultrasound, right? What was the right upper quadrant ultrasound? All of these studies that you didn't do, maybe, some of, the, some of the PGY4s are like, no, it makes you slow, I don't do that. Um, and then you have to go back and see all your patients again when you could have just ordered that from the get-go. Um, well, <coughs> it probably would be faster, maybe, if you had shotgun that stuff in the first place. But now you have to go do all that other stuff. So here you are, PGY2, trying to be fast, and now you have to go find the ultrasound. And I actually did this yesterday. I walked around the ERs trying to find the ultrasounds. Here it was. <laughs> and then here. And it, is this Miss Daly? Uh, no, it's just the ultrasound. <laughs> and then you find it, and you have to, let's see this place, you have to get it to the patient's bedside, and it's this huge thing. And it's like this. It is an epic to get the ultrasound to the bedside. <laughs> this is Andrew Latepley, one of our grads. He's really funny, ultrasound director at MDH. Um, so you get there, and then you have what I call the fat finger problem. Your fingers are too fat to possibly put in the right MRNs and the right names. And you have to type your name, Alex Breville's name for some reason, my name, and then the attending's name, who may or may not have even been there. Oh, and I can never spell my own name either. <laughs> I'm sure you guys can relate to this. How much time has gone by so far? I have no idea. Then you actually have to do the ultrasound. You have to acquire the images. You have to touch the patient, which is pretty gross. Um, and a lot of us aren't really that good at touching our patients. So that kind of is another negative. Um, <laughs> Is this person's chest here? Yep, there is. <laughs> Conrad, thank you, Conrad. <laughs> um, and then you have to write an interpretation. And this is something, again, fat fingers problem. You have to write all of these findings, which no one's quite sure, especially here, what you're supposed to write. But they wrote Brady, good EF, no PC, paracurry, fusion, whatever. So you have to do that. And then let's say you have a positive right upper quadrant. Then you have to go back, and I don't know how much time this passed, 45 minutes. And then you have to order the official anyway. So that just wasted a bunch of time. And when you're a community doc next year at Kaiser, or wherever you'll be in San Francisco, um, that's a lot of time, right? That's a lot of money. If you're RVU based, you just missed a huge opportunity to make more money. And then Dr. Singer comes by and says, is the patient discharged yet? <laughs> 
So it's a waste of time, which is a waste of money, especially if you're in a community system. And you are just spending time doing your point of care ultrasounds and just piling money into the fire. <clears throat> so, whew. all right, so those are only the first two points. And then the evidence, poorly designed, poorly powered. Who knows what this is? EPSS. EPSS, cool. How many people have read the actual first study to show EPSS as point of care? Is anyone? Oh, a couple sound of faculty. Okay. So there's, there's, a, few, there's a few early uh, studies that did this, but one of the main ones was single center. It was prospective observational, convenient sample of 90 patients in the OBS unit for 24 hours. It was done only by ultrasound fellows, right? Is that what we do, right? Do, none of you have even read the study, right? So the level of training is not the same, which kind of goes back to the operator uh, dependence thing. So some, this thing, which we, we think is the best, we think this is the best way to see if someone has a poor EF, it, it, the, one of the best studies was terrible. <coughs> so then when you look, this is from the evidence atlas. When you look, the positive LR for EPSS in this study is two, and the negative LR is zero. <laughs> it, this is not, uh, Dr. Z, would you use this test? No. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> and that's I don't know e how to do it either, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's EPSS, one of the things that we like the most. Um, and then, you know, sometimes you get something that's really obvious, right? So anyone, can you tell what this is? It didn't import that well. This is abdominal study. Yeah, I think people are saying it. So it's a gigantic aortic aneurysm. And then you go back and you tell your attending, I found this huge AAA, right? Ultrasound's awesome. And then you go to Dr. Schechter and he says, but it's operator dependent, right? And this is the idea that said that it's operator dependent and not all operators are equal. <laughs> <laughs> Who here wants to say these two operators are equal? <laughs> I wish Katie was here. But it's not, right? The intern you just started is not the same as me, is not the same as JFK, and is certainly not the same as Katie. So, in summary, it makes you slow, you're wasting your time, you're wasting money, the studies are bad, it's operator dependent, we should stop using it. Any questions? <laughs> well, there goes your <laughs> Excellent. So I'm gonna do a second senior lecture, because there must be a better way, better way says Dr. Cutright, Dr. Cuddy, <laughs> who's not here. And I'm gonna present to you ultrasound as a disruptive technology. Does anyone see this coming? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Unpredictable. Um, and here's another, this is the same uh, presentation as Zhang and me. He's still using the ultrasound probe in the same lecture <laughs> as my microphone. <laughs> Thank you, Randy, for capturing these moments. <laughs> so point of care ultrasound is disruptive technology. Right, do you, I'm sure most of you know what I mean by disruptive technology. Do you think of this? Do you think of Uber? Can anyone else think of other disruptive technologies? Airbnb. Airbnb, perfect. Lather? Grubhub. Grubhub, sure. Grubhub, seamless, yeah. Artificial intelligence, probably. Self-driving cars. What was that? Hoverboards. Hoverboards, yeah. And the idea being that it's a technology that just totally upends an industry. Right? Do you guys remember getting taxis in Manhattan to, Bro to Brooklyn like five years ago, eight years ago? You couldn't, right? You had to just commandeer the taxi, get in the taxi and say, I'm going to Brooklyn, and then hope that they didn't kick you out because that's illegal. <laughs> right? But now that Uber's here, we can get taxis from Clarkson Avenue any time of the day, get home safe, and it costs us like eight to twelve dollars, right? So Uber is one of the best examples of disruptive technology. And I'm here to make the case that ultrasound is also the same way for the medical industry. My points here are, are that it makes you fast, it makes you more money, <coughs> the designs are, the studies are well designed, well powered and large, and we are going towards operator independence soon. First I'm gonna talk about a theory called design thinking. Does, does anyone, has anyone encountered this? Does anyone like from a different job, a different industry, know anything about design thinking? No, okay, good. So it's a human-centered uh, uh, human approach to innovation. So if you think of a problem, you think of what problems that human has to, to solving the problem, right? So, so one example I always think of, and I don't have enough time in the day to do this, but, is, but if the point of care urines, right? 
that's a terrible problem. What is wrong with it? Is it that people are lazy? Is it that people don't make urine here? Or is it just that, or is it just that there's a human-centered problem in that our patients don't have bathrooms there, we don't give them drinks, they get these tiny little things. So design thinking is basically like, don't blame the person, just blame the design. Say that the design doesn't have empathy towards the human experience. And ultrasound is plagued with these issues that I just reviewed in the first lecture. <clears throat> Another one of these examples it, uh, are doors, right? Doors that lack empathy. And I think we have a bunch of doors that lack empathy here. How do you open this door? <laughs> yeah, right? Because the design does not, does not take into account what the human is thinking, right? And this is an example, right? You're pulling, 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 and then it turns out it's a push, right? So there's a ton of things in our, in our environment that we encounter every day that do not understand the human experience, and ultrasound is one of them. <clears throat> This is a better designed door, right? You know exactly what to do. <clears throat> How do these work, right? Legally, every single fire door out to the street has to be pushed out. It's illegal to have a door that would open in because in a fire, everyone's sprinting, you push through the door, right? <clears throat> and ultrasound right now isn't doing this. So the ultrasounds are hidden, so they're hidden despite being large, like we saw. Um, we still have to type these MRIs. We, we have these fat finger problems and then the interpretations. Um, this is actually a pretty, pretty good design, right? Because it solves two human-centric problems. One, most ER docs are too busy to plug it in when they're done and to bring it back when they're done. So if you accomplish both and then enables more people to find it and use it and be faster, this, this targets both of those things. The obvious thing is that these ultrasound <coughs> machines are also getting smaller, right? So this is the stand-up units we have now. This is the, um, oh my god, the M-Turbo basically, and this is the Clarius Pro, which now the, the <coughs> medical bag. And then, obviously, the butterfly, right? This fits into an outdoors bag. This can fit in your pocket, right? So that's starting to change things in a human <coughs> way. The other thing that's different now is that these new portable units, including the Clarius, including the butterfly, including the Lumify and everything, instead of being hardware focused, so when you have these big machines that stand up, you can't replace the software, right? You have to have the ultrasound fellows use some voodoo, uh, and then update things. But here, these updates <coughs> happened overnight two days ago, right? The Clarius, uh, it added color Doppler to its cardiac function, and the butterfly IQ changed the way that you can label things. And this stuff just happens, right? So as the technology advances, you're sleeping, and these things are updating overnight. <coughs> then the fat fingers problem, right? So this is an example of an MRM. Notice what's there, the QR code, QR code. And notice how you guys scanned here, right? If these ultrasounds are based in your hand, on your iPhone, on your Android, on any of those things, and you can just come in the proximity of them and scan the MRN, it instantly uploads the patient data and you're done, right? How many seconds did that just save? I don't know, it takes maybe like a minute. The other thing is, these iPhones, which you're already gonna be doing your ultrasound on, also have RFID. A lot of these wristbands have RFID. So now if someone can just create the way that they just hit the Apple Pay button or some other button, you can not even have to scan the QR code, and you have the patient info, you have the time, you have all of that going. Um, next point, any questions about that? The QR code and RFID, the QR code exists in some hospital systems, the RFID does not exist yet, and if someone wants to make a bunch of money and figure out how to do this, they still can. Um, so this leads to untapped financial opportunity as well. Because we are both performing and interpreting billable procedures which carry a lot of value. And this carries over to RVU-based systems like community hospitals too. Um, we're losing out on a ton of money here, but a lot of places too are not making money on this. <clears throat> so let's take an example. Let's see a 30-year-old ped struck uh, who's maybe tachycardic, right? What is the ICD-10 ICD code that we're gonna use? Acute pain due to trauma. Acute pain, pain due to trauma, mm -hmm. right? And we know the ICD-10 code. This is it. And then we just need some PHI, who, which was already just instantly beamed to our iPhones. <clears throat> now we just need the CPT code. So these are the billing codes that you would use for performing interpreting studies. These are them. These are three different ones. They're limited. They're not comprehensive. All you would need to do is put these in your chart and then work with the billing department. Obviously, I'm simplifying this. And now you can bill for three separate procedures and an, and an impression, right? And this is fully billable. Now, I can't give you specifics on how much this is worth, 
because most hospital systems do not disclose this information. However, when you go on the ultrasound fellowship trail, people talk about this stuff. And by creating a macro in Epic, right, so all of you have worked at Lutheran, uh, and you know how you can do like dot, whatever. You can do dot negative fast. This is fully populated, and they said in the first quarter of doing that, uh, they made $110,000 for their ultrasound department. And then when you ask the question, why do you have 11 ultrasound machines, they say, because we pay for them, right? <clears throat> so can we design this better, right? Can we, can we take a human-centered approach to make this better, make this faster, and make possibly more money if that's what you care about? And the answer is yes. If this, is on your alter, if this is on your iPhone, you can create things that work like your iPhone, right? So this is a template, this does not exist, but indications, and then you choose the indication, and this is your ICT-10 code. And then your interpretation, these views, and then are they positive or negative, right? And that's super simple, and it can go into the, MR, uh, so the EMR, and it can make a bunch of money. Um, and then also just the interpretations themselves, this, is, this was just released on the Butterfly. But basically, it knows what you're looking for, right? It knows you're doing a fast. You hit the buttons, and then you do the interpretations directly on it. Um, and then the next thing is, because these leverage the phones, and I'm not talking about Butterfly here. I'm talking about all of the portable units. They all use, they all use either Android iPhones, or they have, like the V-Scan has its own thing. But they can all do this. It gets rid of this step, right? This step, which every Thursday for the past 15 years, or however long the Oshawa department's been here, uh, the fellows or faculty have to go back this up, put them on a black box, and then go over them. That takes forever. But because this is on an, a mobile system, it can instantly upload to a cloud, right? So now you have all those things that we just talked about, fully billable, instantly uploading over Wi-Fi or an internet signal into your EMR, ready to be billed, ready to be interpreted. And then not to mention, ready to be shared with your surgeons, right? Because if you have this study, like pretend this is positive quality, this is a scan that JFK actually did, you could actually say at JFK or at whoever, hey, here's Coley, you can, you can text these to them, right? And that is how we will get general surgeons to trust our scans, because we'll keep sending them positive scans and they'll eventually believe us, right? There, there's definitely time that that will take, but this is one easy way to get there. And also, go. I didn't put this in the system, but is it go here? <laughs> he told me it's coming. <laughs> so these human-centered design and tech innovations, right, because they are tech innovations, but they're conquering human problems, are going to make us faster, build more, more productive. And this does have a good impact on patient care, obviously, if we're not doing unnecessary tests like CT scans and repeat studies and all of that. Now, how about the evidence, right? Because I already said EPSS, the thing that we use the most is not all that great. Well, using an idea called network theory, the idea being that when more people are contributing studies and when more people are contributing data to a network, we're able to get more powerful conclusions. One, one simple example of this um, is just this study. This was Dr. Sinert et al.'s systematic review and meta-analysis. And this was a huge thing, right? So this is just looking at B-lines and visual estimation of heart failure. And the LRs are much better. Dr. Z, would you use this one? Yes. And this one? Yes. Because it's rule and rule out, right? And they got this by combining, sorry, I don't have this number memorized, 57 studies of this topic with 17,800 patients, right? And this is more compelling, EPSS of 90. And these were mostly people just at the point of care, mostly inexperienced docs doing this, right? So we're getting there, we're getting more research. But then there's also the big data thing, right? Oh, sorry, not there yet. So this was actually, hey, did anyone see this? This should be a journal plug. This is the uh, randomized controlled trial of um, long ultrasound only versus chest X-ray and pro BMP of the diagnosis of acute heart failure. This was a multi-center study across Italy the time to diagnose, diagnosis of acute heart failure with ultrasound was five minutes compared to 104.5 minutes using chest X-ray and BMP. That is insane, right? But this is stuff we already know because we know how to do visual estimation of the heart and we know how to look at B-lines, right? And that's all this study did. Like this should 100% be a journal club article. That's a lot of time, that's a lot more patients, that's a lot more money and better patient care. <clears throat> Just that in review. And the LRs are ridiculous, <laughs> 20.9 and 0.07. 0 
So now, this is the part that I kind of go crazy with, the operator independence. And <clears throat> it is true. And Dr. Z and I had this dis dis discussion because we posted the evidence atlas on the NNT, and they were saying, well, these studies all need an asterisk because they're all operator dependent. People have to know that. And to me, I'm like, everyone knows that, right? That's kind of part of it. But how can we change this, right? What can we do to make this less operator dependent? What can we do to improve this? So one thing that we're doing, and um, our department <coughs> had a tremendous success, success this year. Is Dr. Roseman here? Dr. Roseman and I, and Dr. Eisner, and the rest of the ultrasound department won a grant for $100,000 to buy 10 ultrasound machines to be used only by med students, which, sorry guys, but the med students are doing it. And Dr. Breville is now teaching all these classes with these machines. So these med students are going to come out better trained to do ultrasound than anyone has ever has before. And to be honest, we're late in the game to do this. Downstate's actually late compared to places like Irvine, <coughs> um, who have been doing this for a decade. So it's going to start like that. And then I have to mention this, but the, the POCUS Atlas and the FOMED movement are also empowering to do, people to do this. And this was another human-oriented design solution in that when I was learning ultrasound, there wasn't a good place to find videos or GIFs or examples. And then when I started to teach ultrasound, I still couldn't find these things. So now we can essentially teach the teacher. And currently I'm working with organizations around the world, including Docs Without Borders, and several other places that don't have these um, access to these videos, these case libraries that we have here. And they can build their own lectures. Uh, three months ago, Dr. Borders emailed me saying, thank you, we're using all of your images to make lectures, which we can go ahead and teach people in villages to do ultrasound, right? Um, and then, just a quick review, since this project started, the POCUS Atlas started my PGY2 year, which all of you have contributed to, and all of your images are being used worldwide, there have been over 110,000 unique users of the site, right? So as far as teaching the teacher, striving towards operator independence, this and the FOMED movement are doing huge things. Then, teleguidance. Who was in this grand rounds? Right? I mean, this is, this is crazy, right? This person was in Canada teaching us an ultrasound lecture based on an Android, you know? And what can we do with Ben's project, right? If we can give Ben's project ultrasounds, and maybe those people don't know how to do or interpret ultrasounds, but we can do a video teleguidance, what diagnoses can we make? And then you can just text Kilpatrick to read it, right? And he can be here, right? Um, this, is, uh, this is Dr. Will Smith. He's someone I worked with in Jackson Hole. He is the head of the National Park Service, the medical director of the National Park Service. He did the same thing. He was doing a FAST exam on someone. This is obviously a simulated uh, event. But he was doing the FAST exam with teleguidance uh, or with someone completely across the country. And I'm teaching the National Park Service themselves, the rangers, the, the Jenny Lake rangers and the Tetons, how they can do this also. Right? This is a big deal. And then, of course I have to talk about Brian and Jarrett because I can't make a presentation without it. <laughs> Brian's doing this right now! Right? He's literally in Everest during all these tragedies with an ultrasound machine which was extremely cheap. And he's doing this, right? This is just from his Instagram, right? So as far as striving for operator independence, we are well on our way. Um, and then obviously, I don't know if you saw this, the, the Butterfly had this article in the New York Times showing how they could give these to small African villages to do these. Um, and, and then, you know, pneumonia, the Gates Foundation is supporting several organizations in developing AI to detect pneumonia in <coughs> developing countries, but then OB, right? If we can start doing good OB care, who knows what the effect on maternal mortality will be. Because we don't really think of that, right? We think of point of care ultrasound, you know, we do a ton of OB, but we don't actually think of the actual obstetrics bringing to term, right? But this is a huge impact area. <coughs> so, uh, you know, <laughs> I talk about this so much, and I have to talk about deep learning and AI right now, um, because this is going to be what brings true operator independence to ultrasound. And I'm going to talk about how. Um, so we had a lecture on deep learning and AI, and I'm not going to go into it in detail, but deep learning is basically the idea of creating software algorithms that can behave like the human brain. Um, and once you create these things, they can sift through thousands and thousands of images, thousands and thousands of clips, and then pull out what you need and interpret it. And very, very, very basic understanding is if you think of AI as like a computer that can behave as a human or something like that, <coughs> deep learning is uh, an algorithm that can have different 
nodes, like the human brain, right? So the human brain ha has a, uh, an area that recognizes face, that does sight, that does smell. So it creates all of these different levels, the deep learning part. And then it talks to each other to, to compute tremendous amounts of data and put out very, very good information. And it gets better over time, right? So that is deep learning compared to just artificial intelligence. Does anyone have questions about that? It's extremely simplified. So as an example, deep learning you have in Siri, you have in Alexa, you have in your face ID, which as you use them more, they get better at recognizing your voice, they get better at understanding what you're saying, they get better at listening to you. Man, another example, which all of you are contributors to, is Facebook. And I'm sorry, Dr. Kelson, but we're gonna take you on a ride. So, in 2005 or 2006, all of you started posting pictures to Facebook of your high school friends, right? And you just posted these pictures and nothing happened and then they were fun. You couldn't even like back then. But you posted thousands and thousands of pictures over time. <laughs> these aren't even the bad ones. And <laughs> you posted thousands and thousands of pictures over time. And at one point, Facebook started to ask you to, to find the faces. Right, so you found the faces and you typed in a name and it, it may or may not have been connected. And it, it got better and better. And then eventually it started to find the faces on its own, right? So you put in these pictures to Facebook and then Facebook started to say, oh, I think there's a face here. Is that right? Can you tell me if I'm right? And what is this person's name, right? And then you slowly but surely found more, uploaded more pictures of Kyle Kelson and you labeled them more. Oh, is that Kyle? Maybe. And who are these other people, right? Facebook's able to recognize that there's some green grass or green whatever that is back there. And then there's other faces in this image too. We don't know who they are, but it knows their faces. It, can, it has a node in its deep learning network that knows how to interpret faces. And all of you built it. And then one day, who knows when this was, it knew Kyle, right? It said, is this Kyle? I think this is Kyle. I found a face among a landscape. I found Kyle's face. Am I right? Please tell me I'm right. And you said yes. And you've created the strongest deep learning network in our species history. And then it's getting better. This just happened the past couple months. That Have you gone through your photos on your iPhone? You can go, there's a search function. You can type sandwiches and it finds every picture of a sandwich I ever took. <laughs> I think the number's bigger than this, so it's not perfect. And then bicycles, right? And these are all, pretty much all pictures of bicycles where the bikes are here somewhere, right? So this is crazy. <laughs> and as ultrasounds become more common, they become cheaper, more people are using them, and they're all on the cloud network, your data set is going to get gigantic, right? And all of these places, it's not just Butterfly, it's not just Google, it's not just the Gates Foundation, are currently on a race to create deep neural networks, deep learning networks, to interpret the ultrasound images that you're doing, right? And what does this look like? I use the Facebook example, but so what, what are the, con the con parts of it? So let's do lung, right? So lung, what's in our lung ultrasound? You have some ribs, you have some rib shadows, you have some flora, right? Basic, there's A lines maybe, et cetera. So you create a deep learning network that knows ribs. It, lear it learns how to find ribs, it learns how to find rib shadows, and it learns how to find flora. And then one day, it can do this, right? It knows how to find these things. <clears throat> it knows how to, it, it, so it knows how to find these things, so it pulls from the data, and it presents to you, just like Facebook did, this is a lung. And then you are going to be telling it, yes, this is a lung. Then it gets more networks for B lines, right? So now it knows, it knows Plura, it knows lung slide, it knows B lines, and all these things talk to each other and can say, this is a lung with B lines. Sorry. Am I right? Is this a lung with B lines? And then eventually, you can show it this image, and it knows more than you. Just like it knew that it was Kyle's face, it can say, you are showing me B lines, you are showing me pulmonary edema, this is the diagnosis, right? <clears throat> and this already kind of exists, right? 
this is uh, this is on the butterfly. Uh, let me go back a sec. So if you watch what's happening here, um, it, it knows it's a good image. It's saying you are showing me the parasternal along. It's good. I'm going to record for you. Some of you have probably seen this. Oh, thank. Thank, thank, thank. And it's going to tell you the ejection fraction. Mm. Right? And this exists. This exists. I, you know, we've been using this for the past year. And it's extremely good. Oh, sorry. So let me go back for a sec. Um, well, we can skip that. I can go back to it later. So do, does anyone know the Turing test? Like, did anyone take? OK, can someone tell me what the Turing test is? The movie X Machina. X Machina, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But like, maybe very briefly. Yeah, so the original Turing test uh, from Alan Turing is basically the Turing test will be passed when a human cannot tell if it's talking to a human or, or a computer, right? So this is the human who doesn't know that he, he, well, and he's talking to this other human and he's talking to a computer and the Turing test is passed when they can't tell the difference. That happened a long time ago, right? This, they've already passed this test a very long time ago. but. This is, and I share this with you because this is my ultrasound project next year. This is why I'm going to Denver. We're doing the Turing test for point of care ultrasound. And one of these images was acquired using AI, and one wasn't. We can't tell, right? And it can also tell us the ejection fraction. And once this, once we prove that we can pass the ultrasound Turing test, I think we're there. I think we're operator independent. What do you mean by the computer generated it? Like There's still a human holding it, oh. um, but it will use augmented reality to direct the probe, and then it will interpret it, and then it can tell you that it's a good image. And then the next level is, are those diagnoses accurate? So is the heart not pumping that well? This is next level. Uh, is the heart not pumping that well? And then if so, is there a clinical oriented outcome for it, right? Because this is all, this is just kind of, like this is more like, this is interesting for like nature, like the mag, like the, the journal Nature. Sorry, I'm trying to just play it again. But the clinical oriented outcome, that's like the, yeah. yeah, that's the big fish, right? And that's how I think we're gonna operate. Mm -hmm. So POCUS is a disruptive technology. It's gonna make you faster. It's gonna make more money for everyone. It's gonna help our patients. The studies are getting bigger and larger, larger designed, and I think we're going to get operator independence. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I obviously have to do the thanks. Thanks, obviously, to the faculty and all to all my residents in my class, but specifically Dr. Kilpatrick. <laughs> who has truly been, you know, he wasn't selected or assigned to be my mentor, but he has been the, uh, the absolute most supportive person in his residency, so thank you for doing that. Um, Dr. Ahern, for looking cool, and being a better hipster dad than JFK. The entire ultrasound department, including Randy, Kelly, and JFK is in this as well. Um, this is us in Shanghai. This trip was insane that you took us there, right? We, went, we were in Shanghai, we were teaching ultrasound there. Uh, but Randy, Scott, and Katie, um, just a truly amazing experience. I can't believe I did that. And then, not to this guy. <laughs> I hate this guy. That's a bad sandwich, bro. <laughs> uh, and then to my fiance. Who <laughs> didn't know I was the biggest picture about. So she's gonna wanna leave right now. <laughs> but she's been with me on, uh, sorry, an insane ride. <laughs> and that's it.
<laughs> All right, so the next uh, next portion is a split curriculum for the juniors and seniors. So the seniors, you can head over to the EM conference room at Kings. Oh, you see, see, sorry, I'm an hour late for the rest of you. So. Awesome. Uh, ECC's EM with us on. My apologies. Yeah, who bought me the sandwich? I think it was um, someone from the sandwich department. Someone else. You deserve it. Amazing lunch. <laughs> no, I I know it would be too much. <laughs> All right. Do you guys need two minutes to like bathroom break and everything? All right. Two minutes. That's why I said two minutes because uh, I don't want you to go around. <laughs>